Hello and welcome. I'm Dr Barry Harker and you're listening to Life Learnings. My guest today is Pastor Fred Kamen. Pastor Kamen is pastor of the Fresh Wind Seventh-day Adventist Church in Port Vila, Vanuatu, with a congregation of 600. He was a teacher before he became a pastor. Pastor Kamen suffered a devastating accident as a teenager in Vanuatu. In the first part of our program, I will talk with Fred about his accident and his work as a teacher and minister. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. It's lovely to have you here today. It's a privilege to be here with you. And I look forward to hearing your story. Fred, tell me about the accident that you had. Back in uh, 1983, I was doing grade six uh, and um, after school, I decided to go swimming mm-hmm. um, with two of my cousins and uh, my younger brother. And uh, yes, we were out there swimming. It was on a Friday afternoon. And um, it was getting late. It was around six or half past six in, in the evening when uh, we realized that we, it was getting dark, we need to get ashore. And so we started to, to go ashore. I shouted to the others um, that we need to get ashore. And they were already making their way ashore. I was coming last. Um, when all of a sudden I could feel this pump on my calf, and um, I was, I was scared. I thought first, the first thought that came to my mind uh, was that it was getting dark. I fish might have accidentally pumped into my my leg, uh, but I did not realize at that time that my calf was completely gone. That was the first attack, and. Um, this is on your right leg, isn't it? On my left. On your left yeah, leg. Okay. Yeah. And um, I was scared, so I, I tried to hurry to the shore, but then it came a second time and it caught me right down on my um, heel, close to my heel there, my ankle joint. And we wrestled for a bit and... Was that on the same leg? With on the, the same leg. The same leg, yeah. Um, and um, it broke the big tendon at the back of my leg or my foot there. And um, it went away. I was already close to a rock and uh, I managed to get on the, on the, on the rock uh, because it came the third time. Um, but I was already up on the rock and my cousin threw his piece of timber down to the sea and it scared the thing away. Um, yes, and I yelled to my my younger brother and my two cousins, and they called out to my dad who was waiting for us uh, on the beach. And he came running, and he carried me up the shore. And uh, we tried to figure out a way to to stop the blood from coming. It was such a big wound. Um, we tried, but it was impossible. Everything that we tried, we could not stop the blood and we realized that we need to get to the hospital very quickly. And so my one of my cousins ran on ahead and uh, called my uncle who had a uh, truck and he came with a truck and carried me to the other side of the island. That's where we traveled across to the mainland. And um, it took us about um, 20 to 30 minutes to get to the hospital from mainland or from our landing. And um, yes, all of that time, the blood was just uh, flowing out. And uh, um, I was there on my mom's lap and um, I could hear her praying all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then we arrived at the hospital and um, by the time we got there, the nurses came with a stretcher, took me into the um, their room and tried to 
Well, the first thing they did was to 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 bring a a big rubber band, a strong one, and they put it around my thigh here, and that eventually stopped the blood. Um, but there was virtually no more blood in my body at the time. Um, Were you still conscious at this point? I was still very, very conscious at that time. And I was looking at this wound, and I think basically um, because of my mom's prayer, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really really sure now that because she was praying all along that God kept uh, my heart beating um, because later on I, uh, my doctor was telling me that when I arrived at the hospital there was uh, virtually no more blood in me um, yes and and then they called the doctor um, when the doctor came up I came into the room and tried to to see what happened and tried to see what he could do about about the wound. Um, his conclusion about my leg was that it would be better to to have it amputated. And so, of course, he had to come out again from the theatre and uh, get that permission from my parents and. Um, they did really, they really not know what to, what to say. They did not know what would happen. What they told the doctor was that, whatever you think is is best in the situation, do it. Mm-hmm. And um, he came back in and he got my leg amputated. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the the accident. And uh, that sort of changed my. The direction of my life at that young age, I was 14 at that time, and that that accident changed my uh, my direction. I was I was growing up. Um, I was going through primary school. Um, by the time I get to grade six, I had problems with my my studies. Not that my parents could not afford to pay my my fees. No. They were faithful, but uh, my interest got shifted from the classroom to to fishing. Uh, the sea was a very much a big part of my life, and uh, I love the sea. I love fish, uh, catching fish, and um, yes, I wasn't I wasn't really concentrating, and uh, my life was. Uh, when I was growing up, was basically come home to sleep. I was always up and away from home much, much of the time. Um, yeah, and as a result, I I did grade six four times before I I was promoted to do grade seven. So I gather from this that you were not focused on your studies. No, you were, you were an outdoors person. You loved the water. Yeah, and this accident changed the complete direction of your life and uh, the fourth time I was doing grade six was uh, was the year when I had the accident um, that was October 11 1983 uh, before that I was heading the same direction as the three previous years on or in grade six and um, when I had the accident then I slowed down my life slowed down and uh, um, I could Sit down on my, or oh, yes, at my table in, in the hospital, and do do some more, more serious study, and um, I, I got through. I I passed, uh, and I was selected to go to one of the two top government schools in 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 the country. Um, but I knew that the Lord was changing the direction of my life. How do, how long did you have in convalescence before? You had your your first prosthesis. That was 1983, and um, I got the prosthesis at the end of oh, early 1989. Yeah. So how did you manage getting around until that time? Did you have crutches? I was I was on crutches. I was on crutches. Um, uh, the doctor, my doctor, 
talked me out into um, out of of wheelchair. He doesn't want me to, or he did not want me to um, to spend my life on wheelchair. So he gave me a pair of crutches and took the wheelchair away. So um, yeah, I got very used to the crutches and I moved around a lot. What was the impact on your family? Oh, my mom and dad were devastated um, when the accident happened. Um, they were uh, even suggesting for me not to continue school. Uh, their concern was that how would I, I survive on crutches? How would I do my education on, on a pair of crutches? Um, yeah. How did you deal with the loss of your leg emotionally? Um, obviously, it had a devastating impact on your family. How did you deal with it as a teenager growing up at that critical time in your life? How did you deal with it? I was so fortunate to have a, a doctor and later on the um, physiotherapist. Um, they encouraged me not to dwell on the spilled milk but just to focus on the future and what I can I can do on the crutches. And um, when I came to get my prosthesis, um, they also encouraged me how to make the most of my prosthesis. And so that's that's what I, I now I I don't I don't think of my leg anymore. Yeah. How do you make sense of that injury in your life? I mean it. It was a turning point in your life, obviously. But how do you make sense of it? Is there a, how do you fit that injury into the bigger picture of your life? Uh, well, now looking back, I could see clearly the hands of our, our God in that. It was a tragic accident, of course, but with the way I was living my life before the accident, I, I was heading nowhere, really. Um, but then... I believe that God allowed this to happen uh, to change my life. That is, that is why I am, I am where I am today. How do you think your life might have been different if this accident hadn't happened to you? I wouldn't be in a ministry to start with. Um, I would not have been a teacher. Um, um, I don't think I would have continued school and become successful. Um, Already I, I was heading the wrong direction. My, as I've said, my life was attached to the sea water, yeah. Fred, how did you come to be in Fiji? I went to a private school on my island, and um, that private school took in uh, um, grade six uh, repeaters we, by, uh, since... Um, well, back in 1983, I, uh, as I've said, I have, I was doing grade six for the fourth time. So, that private school was set up to, to take in, uh, grade six leavers, and so. I happened to go to that school, and what happened with, uh, with students coming out of that school, was that as soon as they come out, they. They were sent to Fiji to do years uh, seven to twelve. Um, so I went to that school, and as I've said, as um, when I had the accident, and uh, I spent more time with my books in the hospital, I, I came out successful at the end of 1983. Uh, before the accident, all my papers, like passport and permit and air tickets, were were set for me to go to Fiji to, to do year seven. How did you come in contact with the Ferris family? I went there um, early 1984 uh, to a school in Vanua Levu. Uh, that's the second biggest island in Fiji. While we were there, it closed down, and so we were moved across to Viti Levu, the biggest island to a school, uh, to one of our high schools there, Navesau, junior secondary school then. And um, 
I was I was there from 1984, 85, and 86. I was doing uh, great uh, 10. Yeah, I was doing grade 10 when uh, um, the Ferris's came on a fly and build team and they came up visiting our our school and uh, at that time we the school chapel wasn't completed it was um, it came up but it wasn't completed so they came and assessed the building and to see what what could be done about the, the chapel so the fly, what, the fly and build team were there to, to um, finish the buildings, or no? They just uh, just came in and they were having a look at it to see what could be done to complete it, and that's when they met me. What happened then? After they looked at the chapel and um, assessed it, um, they came to me and said, "We will go back to Australia and." Um, and see if we we could arrange so that you you can come down to 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 have an uh, a prestigious prestigious fitted, fitted on, and um, I was still a young young boy at that time. I was still growing, and they said it it won't be that soon as as we get back to Australia, but we would wait until such time when we know that. Probably you stop growing and then we can arrange so that you come down. So we knew each other then until today. And you're visiting uh, Mrs. Ferris now, aren't you? Yes, I am visiting. I had a problem with my or the foot on my prosthesis. It got broken two years ago. And um, yeah, again, I can see the hand of the Lord in this because... I lost contact with them for quite a, a bit of time, and uh, I could not find, I could not really locate where they are. But uh, finally, from someone in the division, I I get to get into contact with them. Tell me about your teacher education. How did you come to be a teacher? Yes, after they met met me, that was 1987. In 1988, I moved on from Navis out to Fulton College, um, and um, I was doing my grade 11 at the end of that year, 1988. Um, they called and say we have organized everything. You are coming down at the end of that year, 1988. So I came down um, after having my prosthesis, uh, prosthesis. I went back to Fulton, 1989, and then at the end of that year, I went home. I was really not sure whether I made it through year 12 or not, but uh, while at home on holidays, I received a call from PAU that you are accepted or you have been accepted to come and do... PAU being Pacific Adventist University? University, yeah. It was PAC at that time. Pacific Adventist College. Yeah. And that was in Port Moresby, wasn't it? Yeah. You did your teacher training at um, PAC? I, I, when I was growing up, I went to Fiji all these years. Um, I knew I was good in English and social science. And so the back of my mind, I knew I would be a teacher, a good teacher. But when I arrived at PAU, I changed my mind and I, I went to do business. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Why, why did you choose business when you, when you felt that you, you had a future in, in uh, teaching? I, I really did not know why I chose business. Uh, coming out of high school, very young, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden into university and my life was 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 a bit mixed up at that time, so I chose to do business against the knowledge that I um, I knew I, I I would be a teacher, I would be a good teacher, and so I did. From nineteen, yeah, in in the year nineteen ninety, I was doing the business course, uh, Pacific Adventist University, and um, I failed at the end. 
they were going to send me home. But then I, I went across to Dr. Jeff Gibson, um, who was a chairman of the education department. And uh, I asked him if I could switch to do education. And they accepted me, so I went in, and it was uh, two years from 1991 to the end of 1992. That's right. Where was your first teaching appointment? Um, I went home. I was called to go to Auri Adventist Academy. That's our main high school in Vanuatu. But because I was away so much from my parents, so I decided to stay in the private school in which I was doing grade six when I caught the accident. I chose that because I wanted to be close to my parents. Um, and I was there for two years. Did you enjoy teaching? Oh, yes, very much. What did you enjoy about it most? Um, about our interactions between me as a teacher and and my students, um, getting to know them um, personally. Um, and um, it paid off because now I, I'm getting to meet a lot of them in Port Villa, and uh, that's a big reward. Some of them are working, and um, some of them I, I I couldn't remember their names, but they, they come up to me when they see me. That's a pretty satisfying aspect of the job, isn't it? Very satisfying, yeah. To see people develop and, yeah. and grow. Why did you get involved in ministry? If I can go back a bit, uh, when I, I did two years in that private school, and then the next year, 1995, I was in another private school, but in Villa, in Port Villa, and uh, I was there for one year, and then I got a call again from Auri. We need an English teacher and a social science teacher. Would you come? And um, I went to Auri. While I was there, I, I remember the president of... Uh, the Vanuatu Mission at that time came by, came to our for board meetings, and uh, they were talking about the big need of ministers. The mission was in a very big shortage of ministers. And um, I knew when we were going through Pacific Adventist University, uh, they were most, m most of us from Vanuatu were in the teaching uh, uh, they were taking the, the teaching course. Um, a few of us were in the uh, well, a lot of us were in the teaching teaching course, but um, there were there were very few who were doing theology. And when the president was talking about that, I could already picture yes, there's really a shortage in 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 um, pastors and ministers. And so that's why I came up to the decision if we have more and more young people coming to teach, then uh, I guess I could switch on to theology and uh, help in the, the area of uh, ministry. It sounds like it was just a simple need for additional ministers that led you into, yeah. into ministry. Yeah. Did you have to do any additional studies? Yes. Um, after working in Aura for four years, um, I applied to PAU through the mission, and they accepted me to go there and uh, do theology. So by then I was married, and uh, I went with my family to, to PAU. That was the year 2000. Um, to 2003, at the end of 2003. That's quite a long way away from repeating year six four times, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the impact of the, uh, the injury in your life, while it was devastating, also led to you finally eventually becoming a minister. That's right, yeah. 
And that's why I say now looking back, I could see clearly that it was the Lord. The Lord's hand was over me all of those this time. Yeah. Tell me about your life in ministry. What's a typical day for you? And what does a typical week look like? Uh, it depends a lot on where I am um, doing ministry. Um, when I was um, in Aure, uh, it was not so busy as now when I am in Villa or Santo, the two main centers. Um, in Villa, it's very, very busy. Um, you have people coming with all sorts of uh, problems, needing prayer and all of that. Um, besides a weekly roster, um, you, you, you have to preach every week. Um, not every Sabbath, but every week. Um, uh, not only that, um, we have meetings every now and then with the president and in, in the office. So, um, and then we have the visitation program. Um, we have weddings to perform, and uh, in Villa we get a lot of a lot of these things uh, happening. And with, uh, while we are um, conducting new weddings, we have marriages broken. Um, all the time, and we get to call to do counseling and and pray over these people. Um, when you have homes that are not not steady, um, we get to be invited to to pray for those homes and visit and talk with the couples. And so it's a very busy busy program. I'm intrigued by the title of your church, Fresh Wind. It conjures up for me this beautiful wind that's coming in and cooling you down after a hot day in the sun? Yeah, that's exactly what, what happens. We have wind, uh, this breeze that comes in all the time. So when you sit in church, you get a very nice wind blowing and uh, it makes worship very, very, uh, yes, you want to worship, worship God more. Tell me about your wife and family. How did you meet your wife? I met my wife on a boat from the island of Pentecost in Vanuatu uh, across to Santo. Um, really, we did not uh, talk on the boat, but when we arrived in Santo, that's when we we started to talk. I, I engaged her in a conversation, and and that, that's how it started. And um, and later on, you got engaged and uh, and got married. Yes. Have any children? We have one son. And then, uh, well, my my wife went through a hard time delivering the son, and so she they operated on her. Um, um, so they said it won't be until after seven years that you can have another another child and uh, we thought no we that one is enough and so we adopted as a little girl um yeah that's that's our our family so how old is your son and your little girl my son is uh, 16 this year and a little girl selena well my son's name is johnny and um our adopted daughter, Selina, is 11 years old. What are your interests outside of uh, ministry? Gardening, uh, fishing. I still go fishing. I'm sure you're pretty careful, though, aren't you, when you go fishing? Uh, yes. Well, I've been. I've been. I go snorkeling most of the time uh, when I'm on holiday, basically. Um, yeah. To where I was, I got bitten. No sign of any more attacks by shark. I, I really have no idea. But now, um, the thought of getting bitten again by another shark or whatever in the sea doesn't scare me anymore. What's your favourite place in Vanuatu? I understand it's a very beautiful place. Where is your favourite place there? 
my favorite place is my home island, Santo. Uh, it's because, uh, yes, basically because uh, it's my place and I know it very well. I move around very easily and I know a lot of people there too. What do you appreciate the most about Vanuatu and your culture? Uh, happy people. They don't talk too much. Uh, most of the time most of, you go and you feel very comfortable among them. You don't need to be scared of anything very friendly sounds wonderful we'll go to a break now when we come back i'll be talking with pastor fred cayman about his early life more about his education and his christian experience if you have any questions or comments in relation to today's program you can call 3abm australia radio within australia on 02 Four nine seven three three four five six, or from outside of Australia on country code six one two four nine seven three three four five six. Our email address is radio at three abn australia dot org dot au. That is radio at the number three abn australia, all one word dot org dot au. Our postal address is three abn australia inc. PO Box 752, Morissette, New South Wales, 2264, Australia. Thank you for your prayers and financial support. If you've just joined us, I'm Dr Barry Harker and you're listening to Life Learnings. My guest is Pastor Fred Kamen. In this part of our conversation, I'll be talking with Fred about his early life education and Christian experience. Fred, tell us where you were born and where you grew up. I was uh, born on an offshore island southeast coast of Santo. Uh, the island is called Mavia. Uh, yes, that's where I was. Uh, sorry, that's my island, but I was born in uh, the Lucanville Hospital in Santo. In Santo, mm. but that was your home island. What's, yeah. the, what's the island like? Uh, it's a fairly small island. We know everyone, and uh, yeah, that's that's where I I grew up. Is that where your accident took place? Yeah. Tell me about your early life, your very early life, and your family. Tell me about your mother and your father. My my mum was an Adventist. And uh, my dad was not, he was Catholic. My dad did not have the privilege of going into any school. Um, but after listening to our messages, he, when he, he was convinced that um, we have the truth, and uh, uh, when he got baptized into the church, he was an Adventist since then. It was a long time ago, I couldn't remember exactly when he was baptized, but um, it was a long time ago. So he was a faithful father in supporting me through my education. So I've said I've done grade six four times, and he did not give up. He he continued to pay for my school uh, school fees for me to continue my education. Yeah, that's that. I have a... Uh, uh, two brothers and one sister. I uh, have an elder brother and then uh, our sister, only sister, and then myself and my younger brother. It sounds like religion was right there from the very beginning of your life. Yes, um, I, was, I was born into an Adventist family. We can all be born into Christian homes, but that doesn't necessarily make us Christians. Tell me about your conversion. I was baptized at the end of, um, uh, sorry, when I was 12 years old. And um, to be honest, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually, I didn't really know what I was getting into at that, at that age. Uh, I don't know, probably, I couldn't remember now, probably my parents pushed me into getting baptized. But um, to be honest, I... I I don't think I knew Jesus then yet. 
Then um, you had then you had the accident a couple of years later. Uh, that's so right. so when when do you think you were converted? When can you date that conversion? I was actually counting on my mom's prayer when between um, where I I got the accident and the hospital. She was praying all the time, and uh, um, on our way to the hospital, I ran out of blood already. As I've said, when we arrived, the doctor said there wasn't any more blood in my body. But I was still very conscious at that time, and and um, I knew it was through mom's prayer. Um, so that sort of kept me thinking, and then uh, when I slowed down, in my life, in the hospital, I spent three months in the hospital. Um, and then that's when I started to do some serious thinking about my life. And um, as soon as I, I, I came out of the hospital and go back into school, in, to Fiji, away from home, this is when I began to to depend on God. What did you like to do as a very young child? Fishing seems to be very prominent. The water was very prominent. Were there any other things that you enjoyed doing as a young child? Uh, playing football when I still have my leg. Um, I played football, soccer, and um, my life seems to revolve around those two activities, hmm. football and uh, and fishing. What's your strongest memory of your childhood? Was it the accident? Yes, the accident. That's true. What impact did that accident have on your siblings, your brothers and your sister? Um, well, they were, they were, they were sad um, that I lose one of my legs because I, I was born a normal, normal child and we grew up together. I had the accident, they were very sad, but um, not until later on when uh, they see me able to go through school as a normal child and um, when I was treated like one, then um, up to where I am today, um, like me, they they no longer think of the, of the loss of my leg. Who influenced you the most in your early life? My grandfather. Yeah, my S grandfather. Tell me about him. He's a very devout Seventh-day Adventist. Well, he he was converted from heathenism into Christianity. But when when uh, he knew about God, um, we could tell that he the way he kept Sabbath, um, he was he, he hadn't been to a school, but he knew from his little knowledge of counting, he would uh, keep money. Um, when we ran out, we would always come to Granddad for 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 money. Um, he was a faithful church member. Um, he kept Sabbath well, and uh, yeah. Did he ever learn to read? No. How did he understand the Bible? How did he get to know uh, the Bible? From basically from messages that we preach in the church. Uh, we had morning and evening worships when we were growing up. Uh, so it's, so that's basically when um, what access my granddad had as far as the Bible is concerned too. What aspect of your life today gives you the greatest satisfaction? I guess it's, it's the determination that I have uh, when I was coming up. Uh, even though I had the accident, I, I, didn't, I didn't think of it uh, when I was going through school. One thing that... Uh, that kept me going was that I I was I I must get an education. With my situation I have to get an education and 
and that's how I could survive in the future. Uh, so that's basically what what kept me going. And um, when I came in to do the uh, to get the first prosthesis, it was at the end of 1988. I was given a book um, to read, and the book is on uh, Douglas Peda, British soldier who was uh, shot two times in an aircraft. He crash landed and he lost one of his legs. The second time they shot him down, he lost an, uh, the other leg, but he could not give up. He kept on going. He, so that that story was a um, had a great impact on my life as I was growing up. Not to look back and see the loss that I had been through, but to look forward and determine to be someone that God can use. So you had the story of Douglas Bader as a as an inspiration for you yeah. in life. Yeah. I want to talk with you now just briefly about the different cultures that you come across in the South Pacific because you've studied in Fiji and also at um, Pacific Adventist University and they have students from right across the South Pacific. Tell me something about the cultures that you've come across in the South Pacific and how are they the same and how are they different from your own? I, you know, how when we come from a culture we are tempted to think that our culture is is the best, so we tend to impose our culture. But as I was growing up, uh, and I thank God for the privileges given me to go from Vanuatu to do year seven um, in Fiji. A very early age, I, I, I slowly, I spent six years there, and I, in those six years, I, I, I came to appreciate the Fijian culture and see them as they, and saw them as they are. They were Fijians. Um, to appreciate the differences we have in our culture. Um, and so that helped me to, in my work now as a minister, to understand people where they are coming from. In your congregation of 600, do you have people from different cultures and not all just Vanuatans? Uh, they are all uh, Vanuatuans. Uh, we have some, uh, one church member at least from the Solomons, and that's, yeah, that's basically it. But the fact that they come from different islands in the country, they have their own way of life and, and that. Are there differences between the different islands? Oh, yes. I mean, you have a yeah. Vanuatan culture, but there would be differences in culture between the various islands. That's as well. right, yeah. Languages are different, and um, the way uh, church members from other islands behave is a bit different, but this is all all the differences that we have and uh, i'm I'm growing to 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 learn to appreciate these differences. Vanuatu was previously the New Hebrides, and you yeah. had both British and French influence. are there any what are the influences on your culture from the French and the British? Oh, you have a lot of influence. Uh, um, in we have um, um, we we call francophone, yes, French speaking, and we have uh, um, anglophone, English speaking, and we have Bislama. So um, we we weren't thinking about this, but we we are in the process of starting an English church in Port Vila and a French church. And the others are all Bislama church, that's where we we speak Pidgin English. But there, yes, French and English, uh, British have a very strong influence, you know. Now, people, yeah. Tell us one of your stories from your life that most touches your heart and your life. One of the, one of the experiences you've had, not just not the accident necessarily, but a story one of your experiences that really touches your heart? I think one of uh, the other experiences that I have when I got married with my wife, and um, she was uh, pregnant and uh, it came time for, for her to deliver. She delivered prematurely, um, and our son was premature. 
Um, and um, I was called by the nurse to come in and, and, and see our son. So I have to come across from Maori. Um, I was coming up and um, I was expecting to see a normal child. And, and then they took me into this room and um, they pointed to the incubator and say, this is your, this is your son. And he was very small, and I, I, I was a bit discouraged. I mean, not a bit, very discouraged. And I started to question the Lord, uh, asking why must this happen to me when I'm doing your your work, I'm in your service, and uh, um, yeah, I was discouraged, but. But then the nurses say, you don't don't be discouraged. He is okay. He's his size is a bit small, he's born premature, so um he'll come out. And so I went back, I I prayed about it, and yes, slowly God was working and he he began to get uh, bring uh, yes to put on his normal weight and he became a normal child. And um yeah, through that we were um, we were very downhearted, but but then God brought it. He's a normal, normal, healthy child now. Hmm. What are you looking forward to in the future? I'm looking forward to a few more years in the ministry, and then um, I I bought a piece of land where I can settle after retirement. I have a few years yet, but uh, yeah, just looking forward to, and I'm looking forward to to time when my son can get into university and become more independent. Are you looking forward to Jesus' return? Oh, yes, that's, yeah, well, family, as far as my family is concerned, that's, that's what I'm looking forward to, but the biggest thing that we, I look forward to now is is for Jesus to come back when I can have my leg back. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah, very. What have you learned from your life, Fred, that you would like to share with our listeners? I'm sure there are many listeners out there who have experienced a devastating loss or an injury like you have. Yeah. Do you have anything special that you can say to them that will encourage them Maybe someone has not been able to deal with it as productively as you did. Yeah, uh, some some people are very unfortunate in accidents in that they do not come out alive. Um, for me, to be able to go through that experience with the shark and uh, lose one of my legs, but the big thing is that I'm still alive today, and. Um, since the accident, I I could see the way in which God was leading me. Um, I would like to encourage people out there. Um, if you happen to go or to have an accident and you are still alive, the accident is not the end of life. It's not the end of everything. Uh, it depends what you make out of the accident and... Uh, um, I would like to encourage people to be positive, to think positively about life. And I would like to point to, to people who may be in my situation where you go through an accident and uh, you may be discouraged right now. I want to point you to the God that we serve. He is real. I can, I can assure you that, that God is very real and God is always there by your side, even if you know it or, or not. God is always there, and I'm sure God. If God can can lead in my life, as I've seen, I'm sure God can lead to in your in your life. Do you have a favorite passage of scripture that you'd like to read? Yes, when I was in Fulton College, one of my favorite passages of scripture is in Proverbs chapter sixteen, um, verses one. Two and three. 
Um, I'll read that. Um, I'm reading from the New International Version. And it says, To man belongs the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Why is this your favorite passage? Um, this is my favorite passage because I was having other plans. Um, when I was growing up, I'm, my life seemed to be more focused on the sea. And and then when I grew up, um, time for me to come to university, I changed from going straight into the education course and I went to do business. Those are my plans. But uh, God had other plans for my life. And um, when I came across this text and uh, looked back on my life, I... I knew that, no, God did not want me to become a businessman. Um, God did not want me to spend my life in the sea. God has other plans for me. And I knew teaching and ministry are God's plans for my life. Would you like to uh, close our program today with a prayer? We've been talking about your accident and um, the way that you dealt with that devastating accident you have pointed our listeners to being really positive about accidents that they might have experienced mm. would you like to pray for our listeners with a special reference to those who perhaps have had really devastating accidents and have had long periods of convalescence and may still be looking at the consequences of those accidents or injuries or disablements and uh, ask the Lord to encourage and strengthen those people I'll do that gladly. Thank you. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege today for me to be able to be in the studio and uh, do this recording. And we are hoping, Lord, that this experience that I went through will be a blessing to someone out there who may be listening to us at this time. Dear Father, we live in a world where we go through a lot of hardship, a lot of challenges. One of our challenges might be accidents, but if we come out of those accidents alive, we know that it was your will in the first place. Father, I pray for someone out there who may have had an accident and uh, probably they, may, they might be discouraged. They might not see hope. They might not have uh, hope. I want to pray for those people, especially today, that there is hope in Jesus. I say this, Lord, because I have seen your hand in my life through all the struggles and the challenges that I have been through. And through this accident, I had seen clearly your life, or your hand in my life. And I would like to encourage someone out there who may be discouraged today. They might have gone through an accident. I would like to encourage them that you are not far away from each one of them. That you are right there beside them and help them to see you, Lord, to see what you can bring out of their life. And so I commit each one of them, whoever is listening out there, and they may be discouraged because of their various situations. I would like to ask that you will be very close to them, speak to them, encourage them, Lord, and may they look up to you for courage, for strength, for knowledge and wisdom and for health that only you can provide, O oh Lord. Thank you. We'd like to commit every one of them into your care and keeping and help them know, Lord, that 
we live in a world where sin has destroyed it already. And um, yes, in this world, we have no, no hope. But when we look up to you, we have a hope. We know that one day Jesus will come back and take us home. And that when he does, those of us who look to him for help will go home to a place where there will be no more pain, where parts of our bodies won't be separated from us again. And uh, for those of us who have lost part of parts of our bodies, we will receive them back, but in a body that will not be affected by death anymore. We look forward to that time, O oh Lord. And meanwhile, while we wait for your coming, I pray and ask, Lord, that you will be very close to everyone who might be listening today. Encourage them. Help them to see that the hope that we have in you and help them to embrace that hope so that our life in this world will be a life that you will walk through us to be a blessing to others. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this experience. And as I say it now, may it help to be to be a blessing to others. And I hope that others will find you through this experience. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for being such a faithful God to each one of us. And we would like to give our lives to you today and in the coming days. Take us and keep us until and when Jesus comes, we would like to go home to spend eternity with him. That is our hope and it is our earnest desire this afternoon in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Fred, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's been wonderful to talk with you. Mm. And um, I look forward to meeting you on some other occasion. If you come back to Australia and visit, I'd love to see you. Thank you very much. My guest today has been Pastor Fred Kamen. Remember to tune in again next time as I speak with another fascinating guest on Life Learnings. Bye for now, and God bless you and keep you. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.